Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast, brought to you by City Current and powered by Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. This show shares personal stories and insight from those who are giving back and making a difference so we can learn and do the same. We cover life lessons, business advice, passion, and purpose. Now here's our host, Jeremy Park. Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We're in for a fun treat as we focus on the uh, Office of Business Diversity Compliance here in the city of Memphis, doing amazing things with a lady who is a complete change maker. We have Joanne Massey. She's the director of the Office of Business Diversity and Compliance for the city of Memphis. How are you doing, Joanne? I am doing fantastic, Jeremy. That's always a good start. Fantastic. So the fun of the podcast here, Changemakers, is you know you are making a difference, obviously, in your kind of corporate role, if you will, but you yourself personally are heavily involved in the community doing great things. We'll talk all about that. The fun, though, is that we get to start with your kind of personal story. So give us a little background on just where you grew up. Well, I grew up in North Memphis, one of the oldest African-American communities in this city, New Chicago. Um, and I was born, raised there, uh, educated in elementary school, Brownsville Road Elementary, uh, Manassas High School at the time for a couple of years. And then we moved to Whitehaven. My mother uh, bought a house and I completed high school at the middle college the middle college the middle college uh, home of the bulldogs and i uh, went on to get my undergraduate degree a uh, dual degree in business and finance at lemoyne on college the magicians and my master's at benedictine university which is located in a small suburb outside of chicago But I am the first college graduate of my family. I am proud to say that I've had younger cousins coming behind me that have gotten their college degree. So definitely um, made an impact in changing uh, the generational patterns of our family. And and now here we are. I'm uh, married. I have three beautiful children that I don't necessarily call little babies anymore. We have uh, twin girls that are 15 years old. They're um, freshmen at White Station or going into their sophomore year now. That means they're almost driving, too. Oh, don't talk about it. Let me just tell you. That's all I'm hearing all summer is permits, 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 permits. yes, indeed, and clothes, of course. Oh, sure. And then we also have a 20-year-old son, uh, QB Jr. Hey, QB, I'm sure you're listening. Um, But he is a sophomore at the University of Memphis, and he will actually be going into code school this fall with code crew. Yeah. with Emeka Igwekwe. Yeah. Shout out to the Igwekwe's and their uh, family as well. But Cold School is a really great program. So we, uh, my husband and I both come from single parent households and I was pseudo adopted by godparents in North Memphis who raised me for my teenage mother. So I grew up really with a biological father uh, who was absent. Uh, my biological mother, who was a teen, and then this great elderly couple who had been married for, at that time, about 10 years, no kids of their own, took me and my brothers in as their as their own children and raised us until wow. our teenage years. And uh, today, they are granny and papa to my kids, and so my kids are so fortunate. They have four grandmothers, three grandfathers, and uh, we we're, I, I really feel fortunate because adoption is something that back in that time, people then, at least in the African-American community, formally do, but we did have what we called our villages, and so I was so fortunate that the Collins, Geraldine and Wendell Collins, I dare not mention, <laughs> make sure I mention their names, my mom and daddy. Uh, I was so fortunate that they chose me to be their child. And really, truly, uh, you'll hear me talk about Wendell all the time. He was a uh, eighth grade education, forklift driver, Geraldine, the housekeeper, and uh, she graduated high school, but they made sure that education was a priority for me, and I was so, so fortunate to have them take me in. Because that's what I was going to ask is where did the, the focus on education come from in terms of achieving, achieving not just the undergrad but the MBA as well, so, mm-hmm. but I, so them, obviously. Yeah, yeah. My, my, uh, my mother, Geraldine, particularly, she would always tell me, she said, you know, 
I do this housekeeping work, I do manual labor, but you're going to get your education because that's something that no one can take away from you. Uh, both of them, actually Geraldine will be 70 in August and Wendell, he's 76 years old. And so you can imagine a time that they grew up in and uh, taking us in as their children, that was one thing they wanted to ensure that we had a strong foundation and understanding of the importance of education. And so um, they are really, really, truly uh, a beacon for me to strive. And so it's really great that they get to see the successes um, that that I've been able to have. And, and truly, I, I never want to miss an opportunity to thank them because <clears throat> Wendell took care of a child that wasn't his, really. He didn't have to. And Geraldine took care of a child that wasn't hers. But they love us, and they love my children and my husband like we're their own. And so I always tell people um, having someone in a child's life who can motivate them, care for them, and, 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 and really truly show them a different way uh, is, is really, really important. So I, I always look for opportunities to give back in that way. I love it. Was it difficult for you or did you know any different when it comes to not having um, someone who had been to college? I mean, you mentioned being the first in your family. So being the first, you don't necessarily have mentors or guidance. Was that difficult at all in terms of navigating college and then obviously going off and getting your MBA was that was that a challenge at all or did you even think about that you know I did and as a matter of fact uh Jeremy I was one of those kids if if I don't know what they call it now they may still call it clue my kids are an optional and you know they have uh, AP now Mm -hmm. advanced placement but back then I was one of those kids that was identified as a lot of potential um going to my, my biological mother Uh, Again, you know, she's in her early 60s. And so, again, the time that she grew up in and she was one of eight and her father had left her mother with eight kids. So she didn't have a lot of education opportunities either. But the thing about it, the woman is a math genius literally a math genius and I and we used to always talk and has she not become a teenage mom you know she wanted to be an accountant so I say that to say that you know in in a way intelligence can be hereditary and I always felt like that as I was identified as a child with you know gifted high intelligence and that came a lot from my mother I still did not know that I could go to college College, you know, coming up, growing up in New Chicago, college was for the rich kids that lived out east, you know, or for people that had a mom and dad in the house. I really just didn't know. And my godparents told me to go to college, but they had no idea how I should get there. They had no idea. Just graduating high school was for them a real accomplishment for me to get there. Right. And so when I was 14 years old, uh, I was at Manassas. I was in the eighth grade because, you know, Manassas used to be 7 to 12. And I was in the eighth grade at Manassas. And one of my counselors, they were like, you're a really smart kid. You should be in this program called Upward Bound. And I had no idea what it was. The person at the time over the program, his name's Tony Spratlin. And Tony um, interviewed me you know, looked at my test scores and said, yeah, you should be in this program. And he said, you are going to college. And I'm 14 years old, and I'm looking at him like, how am I supposed to do that, and what am I supposed to do? And uh, I will tell you, it brings tears to my eyes, because if not for Tony just telling me that, like, Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to do it, I wouldn't have been able to. And when he told me that I was going to go to college. He went to my parents, my godparents and my biological mother, and he said, this child is gifted. She needs to go to college, and I'm going to help you all do that. And so it became, you know, understanding about financial aid, understanding about where I could go and ACT, what I should do. Nobody had inputted themselves in my life like that but Tony, or before Tony, and, um, I will tell you, and I've had the opportunity and the blessing to be able to tell him in my adulthood that he changed my life. 
he really helped us and he became a member of our family in a way. And so after Upward Bound and completing it, it was no doubt that I was going to go to college. And, um, you know, Tony did everything. Tony literally, and a lot of African-American families, Jeremy, have this in with children, first-generation college um, entrance. You're required to provide financial information for financial aid to the college institution. Well, African-Americans historically in that light have not really trusted, you know, government entities. And so when I told my mother, Tony had told me, you know, go ask your mom for her finance, you know, her tax returns. And I go to my mother and say, Mom, I need your tax returns. She's like, no way. Right. No yeah, way. Yeah. I'm not letting those people in my business. You're not going to know my business. And she didn't know. And in her, in her, her ignorance, dare I say her ignorance was not intentionally meant to harm me. Right. But that ignorance is harmful. And it, it's a hindrance. It holds our kids back. And so Tony came to the house. Like he drove out. He didn't have to. That was not part of his job. But he drove out. Knocked on the door, told my mom he wanted to talk to her. She trusted Tony, right? Because she knew that he was he had speaking positive. He right, had honest right, intentions, right. and 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 he act, and he told her we do need it, and he showed her where it said on the form we need it and why, and she rarely gave it. But again, without his help, being a kid mm-hmm. who knew nothing about this process, I could have literally been stuck. I could have literally been stuck. So. And, and and I have some other, you know, Tonys in my life, right. some moments in my life. But well, I've that got to believe, one. like, the teachers, even, like you said, giving you the confidence to know whether it's AP or Quest or, you know, but, but identifying you and giving you the confidence and seeing something in you that says, hey, you need to be on this path. And obviously for Tony saying, hey, you are going to college and I'm going to help you and then going to that extreme. But I think, you know, for listeners, your story is a powerful one in terms of just people intervening and saying, hey, like you said, they biologically they're not your parents, but stepping in and saying, I'm going to adopt you as my own and look at obviously how that relationship has blossomed. And then Tony stepping in and saying, you are going to college and I'm going to help you. The power of the, the relationships and just stepping into someone's life and giving them the confidence, but also kind of taking that next step. I mean, you look at how it completely has changed your life. Absolutely. And not just your life, but the life of your children, your family. You know, you're talking uh, generational change. Absolutely. Absolutely. My, um, you know, even with my husband, um, we met my 12th grade year at middle college. And so that quick story, if you don't, if you'll indulge me here. So I'm at middle college. I'm a senior. By this time, I'm extremely focused. Like I'm on the road to be valedictorian. Uh, I was, <laughs> I was right there. The principal told me the first semester, probably big mistake. You could get, understand that. But she told me, she's like, you're, you know, you're set, your numbers, you're, you're going to be valedictorian. Okay. I'm working at UT in the department of physiology and biophysics I had entered into a summer program initially where it was just supposed to be a summer job again all of these people who have supported me and lifted me up and so instead of working at you know a fast food restaurant like some of my peers I'm literally in a lab at UT doing experiments with scientists wow and reading you know medical journals and so forth and um I had on my my white coat because that's what you wear at UT, and I was really proud of that. And I'm coming out of the building there. Middle College was located at Shelby State. I'm coming out of the building, you know, just really serious, studious person. And there's this guy, really cute guy, uh, really football playing, look like you know, total jock, uh, but but really sweet. And he uh, does the typical, hi, beautiful, you know, can I get your number? And it was really funny because, of course, I gave him the sneer because that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, I walked over. He's like, well, I'm signing up cheerleaders. And I'm like, I'm a cheerleader. And he's like, oh, well, can I have your number? And needless to say, I gave it to him. Uh, that night we talked on the phone. And this was back in the day when you had a phone that plugged into the wall. Uh, woke up the next morning with the phone on my chest and he was still there and he said I knew you would be my wife 20 years later 
we will be celebrating 20 years in February of 2019. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So it's good to know those lines do work for those young listeners. <laughs> those lines do actually, you know, sometimes work out. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I gave him a hard time for a while, but but he won me over. I guess I'll keep so there's, you don't You don't have to be so smooth. It does help that obviously, you know, that you were attracted to him physically. But they don't, in other words, there's hope, men, that you don't have to be very smooth sometimes. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> 20 years later, three kids later, I guess I'll keep them. But, but it was, again, just from, from, from all of that experience of having folks there. And he's my, he, he says, he's my rock. He's my number one cheerleader. You know, for him, it was the same thing coming from. And I think it's very important for everyone to know that it's not just enough to get into college and to have the grades. What I learned for myself and now what we do for our son, uh, who's now second generation for us, uh, college, is I still, even though I went to college, I didn't have the support. So I, it's by support, I mean financial. My parents, couldn't, there was nothing they could do for me. I mean, literally, uh, the best that my godfather could do for me when I graduated and was going to college was co-sign for a car. But I had to pay the note, I had to pay the insurance, so I had to have a job and I had to, you know, be in school. And so my husband, then my boyfriend at the time, uh, he was very helpful and supportive. Uh, all in all, though, it has, it, it's been a journey, but going back to, you know, what really motivated me, what really stuck, stuck is that, and to this day, Jeremy, is... I have so many people that believed in me. Take my word for it. There was the peanut gallery that didn't. I was going to be a single mother, you know, mother like my mother. I was going to be a teenage, you know, everything drop. I mean, people said all those things because they judged where I grew up and who, you know, birthed me and, and what they saw on the outside, but they didn't know my heart. And they didn't know that, for me, because of all those people that supported me, I couldn't let them down. I could not. I knew that the investment of time, commitment, passion that they gave to me, that I had to keep going. Did I stumble? Definitely. When I entered, I started at the University of Memphis. So I told you I finished at LeMoyne. I started at the University of Memphis. And um, I, I would be remiss not to mention her, and God rest her soul. Benita Lyons was the Dean of Academic Retention at the University of Memphis for many years. And anybody who hears her name and knows the university, they know Dr. Lyons. But it was some stumbling blocks, working two full-time jobs at the time, you know, one, well, one full-time, one part-time, but working that full-time job after classes, going to classes, you know, full schedule, it was tough. And I had, and, and I had gotten to a point where it became really hard. And because I had been driven for so many years, I burnt out. And I like to tell this part of the story because it's really important for people to know just because you fall doesn't mean that you can't get back up mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you still don't have hope and I think that's really important for people to understand and so I had gotten on I, I lost my scholarship that I was given and uh I I had gotten on academic probation and so I had to sit out uh, a semester and Dr. Lyons, I was, I mean, at that point, I was ready to give up. I was like, forget this, you know, I'm going to go work because my mother, uh, my biological mother worked at Cleo Rap. I was going to go and work at Cleo Rap. And I literally went to my mom. I got the application myself. All the people in the office knew me. They were really supportive. And I went and got the application from the office. And my mom worked in the boxing area, you know, for Cleo, they box up stuff. And so I went down there to her. I was like, Mom, fill out this application. They're going to give me a job here. She looked me dead in the eye. She said, you will not work here. Go back to school. Get out of here now. And went to Dr. Lyons. She helped me get back in. 
my husband and I, when we got married, my boyfriend and then we got married that same year and um, I transferred to Lemoyne, but I didn't give up because my mother didn't want me to be there mm-hmm. like she was, mm-hmm. you know. And Dr. Lyons, again, supported me right. and showed me what to do because I thought when you failed, that was it. But she wouldn't let me stay down. Yeah. She wouldn't let me go get down on myself. That's how you get back up. Exactly. That's awesome. Carry that forward because I think all of these really shed light on the work you do and I think the experiences you've had, but how you can use those to help others in a big way with what you do. So, I mean, I think in a cool way, I mean, even just knowing I, I didn't know half of this and to see now what you do, but how all these stories come full circle to have empathy, to help others, to know the obstacles that they're going through. Um, I, I think it really does um, illustrate what you do, but why you do it so well. So talk about the work that you do right now. So the work that I do right now is focused on helping small minority and women-owned businesses grow capacity and access opportunities. Um, You know, I've said it before, Jeremy, but it's not, it's hard work and it's heart work. And it means so much to me. And I, and I appreciate you um, saying what you just said, because it really truly is the driver. Like this isn't work for me. This is real, really a passion. And that passion stems from the fact that, you know, I know, and I want Memphis to understand there's a community of hardworking people in North Memphis. And it's easy for people to say, get up and help yourself. Get up and do better. You know, get up and and try. Because look at me, I tried. Look at me, and I did it. I accomplished it. But there are so many other barriers and hindrances that people don't understand. Like I said, my own mother, knowing that she really truly is a, a numbers genius and a very smart person and really passionate. But poverty is so discouraging. Racism, you know, institutional discrimination and racism and things like that. I get it. And so when you see me and, you know, obviously I have an education and credentials and, you know, I'm here, but I, I, empathy is the right word. Yeah. Well, I mean, you see the very polished you in a corporate role doing this good work. At the same time, though, then you realize all the adversity and the challenges that you've overcome, the times that you've fallen, how people helped you get back up. Now you get to be that person helping somebody else get back up. I mean, I think, I mean, to me, like I said, I, just knowing half of the story, it, it, it really shed light on the work you do and why you do it so well. But now knowing more of the story, it's like, wow, okay, now this, this makes perfect sense on how you're able to do what you do, but why you do it with such grace. Thank you. Thank you. It, like I said, it really truly is a passion. And because I know the impact that the opportunities provided to me have impacted my entire family so you know i get to do great things for my godparents right and and they they love it my daddy um has uh, has enjoyed himself in retirement you know and i and there's always more to do but even more than that uh you mentioned it earlier my children my own children um from a generational standpoint my husband and i were able to stay at a time you know some years ago the cycle's broken Wow. They're good. Yeah. And, and and that's our, you know, that's our thing. The cycle is broken. And so where we are able to impact is our future generations. And, you know, so now our son at 20 and the support he has in college, which, you know, I knew that he needed. And I knew it wasn't OK to just say we've got him in college. Now what? But we support him. And, you know, he's he's doing fine. Uh, but the thing is, is that I know that there are communities of people who need that support. And so taking it back to our entrepreneurs, but for an opportunity, but for an opportunity for me to be able to go to college, I wouldn't be sitting here with you today. I might be passing you by on the street somewhere, but I wouldn't be sitting here. So, but for an opportunity for our small minority and women-owned businesses to get 
a chance, where would they be? Where would their families be? And how will our community be impacted? So one thing that um, Mayor Strickland talks about uh, when, when he speaks about these efforts is this isn't just for small and minority and you know women-owned businesses. This is for our entire community. If we are able to create um, you know, additional revenue with businesses and those businesses hire people in the community. That reduces crime. It helps improve the quality of education, the quality of life. It helps everyone. And so it's almost, we need everybody supporting this. Everybody all in, not because it is going to be an advantage to them because it will, but because it is also the right thing to do. Absolutely. There's a a massive ripple effect all throughout the community. Share success. I mean, there's been a a lot of success. um, And obviously, like you said, there's still a lot of work to be done, but you, you're seeing results, you're seeing impact, you're seeing um, that that there are opportunities that are unfolding. Um, Share what success kind of looks like to you and and maybe share maybe one or two things that you can point to that say, these are some things that people need to know about. We have have a global audience, which is nice. So here's your chance to kind of share a little bit of good work and the impact that you're having. Well, I, you know, I will tell you, Jeremy, I work and, and I'm very, very fortunate again to be able to do it because I have, I'm a member of, and I represent Tennessee for an a organization called the American Contract Compliance Association, ACCA. And ACCA is a group of about 500 now practitioners across the nation that do this supplier diversity work, uh, equal business opportunity work. And what I've learned is, is that this isn't just a Memphis problem. It's not just a Tennessee problem, but it is a nationwide issue that can resolve so many of our societal woes. And so in representing Tennessee as the state coordinator, I get to talk about that on that platform and help kind of cultivate our strategies. And what I've learned is a lot of best practices. And so the, so success is really truly that one day that may not necessarily happen in my lifetime, but the goal is to relieve the disparity, to look at how you create equity, which is a very important word, and it's becoming a buzzword for people, but it's way bigger than a buzzword. It is truly the goal to create equity and equitable opportunities whereby people are able to access those and again to help you know particularly in this area grow their businesses but equity and employment and equity and access you know all those things are really really important progress wise Jeremy I'm fortunate that to be a part of a team effort that has taken us from you know 12.67 percent in December of 2015 right before Mayor Strickland took office but for his commitment and city council and the rest of the administration and very importantly the city staff and shout out to obdc team you guys are awesome uh we've increased that number to 21.33 percent of the in the third quarter we're coming up on the fourth of uh fiscal year 18 but that's a 69 percent increase now mind you we take that as progress And we're very proud of it, but we're not having a parade because there's more to do. Because what does that really mean? Our budget, operating budget, is about, you know, average $700 million. million. What is that in the bigger billions of the economy? So what we've been able to do most recently, and I'm very proud of, a partnership with Christian Brothers University, Starco, Epicenter, and our corporate partner, FedEx, We've created an initiative called the 800 Initiative that is focused on helping those businesses that are at the stage of where they're scaled a little bit. They've got a couple of employees, a couple of million dollars in you know revenue annually, but they're stuck, and they're stuck for a reason. Remember I said, I didn't know about college. I didn't know how to get there. I didn't know what to do. They're kind of stuck in that same place. They don't know what to do to get to the next level, right. they don't have the resources. And it's social capital, political capital is included in that. 
you know, they're not necessarily having lunch or dinner at the interim. You know, they're not rubbing the shoulders with folks that they need to to grow their business. And so the 800 initiative is really meant to not take all 800 of them because that's that's not going to happen. But for the first three years, we're focused on, you know, 50 or so and taking uh, 50 of those and really making that 800 event over each year, taking that 800 and making it a thousand where we've grown them. And so we're moving up 200 of those. We have 39,000 businesses, by the way, <laughs> in this community uh, that are just African American, just minority. Taking 200 of that 39,000, moving them to the 800 right. to make that 1,000, and then taking an additional 200 of that 800 and putting them over. So that they become, you know, and they can give back. They become supporters. They can give right. back. There's and, a strategic approach. There's kind of a graduation pipeline process to maturity and helping them to grow and expand and then kind of continue to pay it forward, if you will, too. Exactly. But exactly. I think, you know, all of this, it's, it's your experiences, obviously, but so much of this, even when you talk about moving the, the needle a little bit, it's it's being intentional. It's intentionality. And we're the first to say if you're blindly going about the way you spend money, the way you do things in general, you're never going to, um, one, notice where you can uh, increase those or make a better difference or be more efficient, be more effective. And it's it's putting a laser focus on, okay, these are our priorities. Now, how can we incentivize and get things to start to move that needle in the right way so that there is this ripple effect in the community so everyone wins? And then how do we actually give people the right tools and resources and mentorship and guidance so that on both sides, we're filling that gap? We're making it intentional now to to laser focus on this and putting that as a priority. And now we're giving the tools and the access and the resources to those who need it so they can get over those hurdles to then be able to take full advantage. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and the listeners should know, Memphis should know that this isn't an overnight thing. So this plan has been in the works for at least three years. Uh, we piloted through Propel. Propel was where we started, and Propel was a, a minority business accelerator where we took these techniques and see how they worked. Well, we have now, and I don't want to get the numbers wrong, so I won't quote them, but we're in the millions now with the businesses that we have helped them increase their revenue. Uh, in addition to, and I know this number is right, 24 new jobs in a two-year period with three classes of Propel. The other great thing about it, and I'm really, really excited. I mean, again, you know, people don't see my face, but I cry tears and these are yeah, tears. I, say, yeah, you, you, I, yeah. I love it. I love it. We have revitalized universal life. It's back open. And all of this programming is going to come out of that space with our private partners and you know cbu is going to look to build an innovation center on their campus but even then still these services this programming is going to come out of there so the history of universal life is je walker believed in helping businesses small businesses in the community that were disadvantaged and had a need founder of tri-state bank or one of the founders um a trustee for Mississippi Boulevard where he invested and scores of business owners would come in and out of that door with Mr. Walker and in fact one less his demise as we you know all know and they but he helped them and so when I think about what my history and my legacy is and I and I don't I don't know who my ancestors are outside you know as far back I can go as my great grandparents that's as far as I can go as far as I know, but I know Jay Walker is a, 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 a my history in my community you know and so I take great pride in being able to what I consider to be an Andre folks who works with Starco our partnership with this we're picking up the torch where J E. And you know the folks who mm-hmm. behind him had to had to leave it. Yeah, I love yeah. it. Wow. So let's. This is one of the conversations we could have for hours, um, and I think you know, this might be one of those where we'll, we'll invite you on and talk about a whole different thing. <laughs> but um, let's go ahead and, and switch gears a little bit and just talk about just we, we kind of call it a lightning round, but it's it's just fun short questions, just you know, kind of off the top, off the cuff. But what's a, a recent book that you've read? 
Wow. Um, so I find myself reading a lot about supplier diversity and all of that now, but um, I, I really like to go back to the old things I read. So Nora Zeal Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. Uh, I, I, it inspires me. Uh, she inspires me. And I like to read a lot about because I, I, I don't, again, like I said, I don't know my ancestors. So I look for pieces of African American history in those fiction and, you know, nonfiction books. And so I look for things like that. So how do you recharge? How do you relax? How do you, how do, how do you, where do you find your energy? Um, well, I'm very, very fortunate. I mentioned my husband and my kids. They're a hoot. My girls and I were dancing in the mirror today to Life Jones. Uh, <laughs> and they were, they were, we were like grooving. Um, but I find my energy in my family. Uh, Jeremy, I, I'm so, so fortunate again to just have people that come in my life. Um, our church members, and we have an elder of our uh, church, Elder Colin Mitchell. He is like a father to me as well, and he will reprimand me when he needs to. But I find my energy in prayer with him. Uh, sometimes I'll just call him on the phone. It's like, Elder, I need a prayer. And he'll give it to me right there. If there was a saint walking on earth, it would be Elder Mitchell, let me just tell you. Um, but I also find it in, uh, you know, in music and meditation. Um it, 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 I'm really, again, really, really fortunate. I have a great, great family. Uh, I mentioned about New Chicago and North Memphis, and literally, don't laugh, but I have 50 cousins in that community, like 50 of us, literally at one time were in school together, even at Manassas. And so we're going to be celebrating soon. Uh, we're all going to a comedy show together, and I get to hang out with my family. So it, I was it's about to ask, family. Man, like family traditions, I mean, family reunions, it's got to be a big get-together, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All the line dancing that you can handle, uh, for sure. But, no, we, we have a lot of fun. And, again, you know, being the first college graduate, being the first one to kind of, you know, lead the way and, 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 and like we say, make it, make it out, make a way for folks, uh, I just have so much support. And there's no better feeling, if you can imagine, um, my godmother, Geraldine, I mentioned her, calling me on the phone. She's like, baby, I see you on TV. Keep up the good work. Like, that's the best feeling ever because there is no money that could pay them back for taking me in. And, and you know, when, when honestly nobody else could take care of me. And to know that she's proud and she gets to brag to her friends. Oh, my gosh. I tell you, I, I, uh, I just keep going. But it, it it really truly this work is energizing too because when you get business owners who come and they're like you know i got a contract or they're like I, you know i'm hiring new people and they call me and they want me to come and you know do a job for them in atlanta because i did this job here it's that it's that that drives me and honestly because i really do feel like i could see the impact nothing else, nothing else feels better than that. Just nothing, nothing at all. So give me maybe one, I'm sure they have tons of nicknames for you, but give it, give us one nickname. Oh my God. Are you serious? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I won't, I won't give you, I won't give you the easy one. This is how you'll know like me. who listens to the podcast. Oh Cause they'll start calling you. From walk by, somebody's going to be like, Hey, stank. <laughs> <laughs> you are inside the inside if you know that my godparents call me stink. But let me just clear it up. I don't stink. <laughs> I don't stink. No, it was um, when I was a little bitty girl, my godmother told me this. They all they all call me stink. And she said, because every time I would walk by somebody, they'd be like, he stink. He stink. I was just that little girl. And so they would call me stink. So, That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. Give me... Um, when someone comes to town, like a, a tourist or family, anybody that's, that's you know coming to Memphis, where do you like to take them? I am um, a, a, a connoisseur of really, really good barbecue. 
and I'm about to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna name drop some places? I'm name all some places, and somebody's gonna be mad. I love you all. Mwah, mwah. No, um, I, I I really do like barbecue, and to be perfectly honest, uh, my husband barbecues really well, and so does my nephew, who's 26 years old. Hey, Court. But uh, he's that's good learned. to give him the first praise to the family. Yeah, that's good. I, I give it to them first. But uh, second to that, I'm going to have to go with bah, bah, so like this dramatic pause. Right, dramatic yeah. pause. It is going to be Corky's. Nice. Corky's. I, I love Corky's. And that's more kind of on the, if you want to get not too fancy, but you're kind of midway. Yeah, we take cor- people to Corky's all the time. The Peltz family, Trisha, Woodman, I mean, the whole group is amazing. So, yep, definitely. Yeah. And then I, and I dare not uh, mention our second really kind of, you know, down home when it's just, you know, my, my college friend or somebody. Uh, it, it is Central Barbecue. Uh, Craig and those folks awesome. are awesome. They've always been awesome. Literally, uh, as a Peabody dad, my girls attended Peabody Elementary. He pretty much adopted, especially the older one, like her and Craig were always egging each other and stuff. And he's always been supportive of them. But Central Barbecue is our family place. And if you ask the twins where they want to go get barbecue today, it would be Central Barbecue. Nice. What, uh, in terms of just like other places to go for those that are listening and say, hey, I'm going to come to Memphis, where should they go? Where else would you tell them to go? Um, Outside of the food, just twin right. different places. I mean, right. Obviously, there's National Civil Rights Museum and Graceland and Stacks and now Memphis Rocks across the street. There's so many really cool things. Where, where do you like to guide people? Um, well, I will admit since the creation of Netflix and Hulu, I'm pretty much like, oh, my house is my sanctuary. <laughs> come, to house. come to my house. Come to my house, everybody. Come on. Um, but I really, I, I, I mentioned about the prayer and the meditation. I find a lot of that in nature, right? Mm. Memphis is so beautiful. Shelby Farms is and has been especially when I have the time my second home I just like to go out there and just be in the middle of what I consider to be um, you know one of the most peaceful places in the city but truly in the country one of the most beautiful places and so um, got a little bit older now so I don't do the running I used to do but the green line is uh, the best thing going in my opinion um, my kids are a little bit older too, so um, the Children's Museum. I'm a big kid, so I like to go. Yeah, if yeah. they won't go, I'll they have go. the carousel now and everything. So it, exactly, exactly. And then you mentioned some of the other places, but I just like Memphis, and I and, and what I like about us more than anything, and I say this all the time, we're a small town that's in kind of a you know big city. And so when you go downtown, it's not so massive that it's overwhelming, but there's a lot of things to do. So don't ever say there's not anything to do in Memphis. Get up and go do something because there's plenty to do. But downtown, um, you know, I like the area over there because uh, I worked at one time at Carl Ike. But I like the area over there, like, you know, Kirby and Massey. Oh, my gosh, those houses are so beautiful. And so we'll sometimes, I have friends over there, we'll sometimes spend some time there. Memphis is just a really, really neat place. So there's a lot of things to do. Uh, But when I do have visitors, I tend to, you know, try to help them navigate to their interests. But the places I always make sure that I show them, is really our downtown uh, for sure, and I like to I like to take people to my neighborhood. Yeah, because to me, uh, and people again going back to what I said, New Chicago is a is a beautiful place, and it's a lot of hardworking people. And yes, there's a lot of blight, and yes, there's a lot of um, you know vacant homes, and you know all those things. But if you just take a little bit of look and open your eyes. You'll see those yards are cut where people live. There's little flowers out there. My godparents have cats, so they have their little kitty bowl. They're just like everybody else. They don't have all the resources and the means and all that. 
And oh, by the way, I keep trying to tell them to move, and they're not moving anywhere, by the way. You can figure that out. But it's a beautiful place, and if people will just open their eyes, and if, like, you know, Mayor Strickland and the group is already doing, making investments in that community to help people, lift them up. That's all we're trying to do is just lift them up. So much of that, it's that self-fulfilling prophecy. If you go in saying that um, I'm looking for the good, you'll find the good. If you go in looking for the bad, you'll always find the bad. Absolutely. So I think you know, so much of that is the, the attitude, the mentality. But uh, that's a, I love that, uh, just opening your eyes a little bit and seeing that the, the lawns are cut and the flowers are there. Uh, that's, that's awesome. So uh, are you uh, wake up early, stay up late? What's your, what's your <laughs> typical uh, mode of operation there? Depends on who you ask. No, just um, it, honestly, I am a up early and a stay up late kind of oh, person. Both. Yeah, I'm both. <laughs> you never I'm sleep. I, so do you drink a lot of coffee? You, you know what? I don't drink coffee anymore. <laughs> I, I'm, I have a multivitamin now. It helps. <laughs> but I uh, people will tell you sometimes they'll get emails from me at 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, why are you reading the emails? Go to sleep. I'm working here. But um, I, I, I am rounded. But I will say this, and I mentioned about my family, Saturdays and Sundays are for them. And I find pockets of where, you know, if I need to get something done, I will. But the weekends, those Saturdays and Sundays are for them. I devote that time. So I'm okay pushing it, you know, those five days a week. Um, Because like I mentioned in in college, I was full-time literally you know, a job and a half. And then even with my son uh, being born later on, before I even finished uh, my master's, hey, you know, you just get it done. But the work energizes me. So Mm -hmm. this is... This is nothing. This well, like nothing. you said, it's it's a it's a calling, and you enjoy it. So, last question: you've, you've kind of touched on it throughout the interview, but um, the last one that I always I like to ask outside of just contact information is: what do you hope your your legacy is? I mean, obviously, every single day you're working on that, and like I said, you've alluded to it throughout the interview. But what do you hope people say about you and the work that you're doing, and just who you are as a person? You know, Jeremy, it's, it's funny you ask me that because I had a, a great privilege that will soon be announced, but I'm going to go ahead and take the privilege of mentioning this right now is um, I was just approached today by the Women's Foundation to be the co-chair for their Young Women's Initiative program that is focused on helping young girls, particularly girls of color, find themselves find opportunity find their path and how they can have an impact not just on their own lives but on their community because being a little girl and the way I sound now is exactly how I sounded then and I was actually this tall at 13 so imagine (laughs) but um, but I had to find my voice and I had to find my way and people helped me and so my Legacy, I hope, is one that shows young girls, and particularly girls of color, and particularly girls who are born in disadvantaged situations, that you can be anything you want to be. Nobody can tell you what you can't be if you believe in yourself and if you never give up, period. That's all I want. And I uh, want some grandkids one day. No time soon, TJ. No time soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joanne, I mean, I absolutely love it. I greatly appreciate all you're doing. Um, you are definitely a change maker. I mean, that's it's so easy when you when you just you exude not only joy and radiance and, and love, but just the work you do. And I think that's it's so easy to see, even not just here in person, but through the microphone. Tell listeners how they can you know learn more about the work you're doing. How can they connect in? Where would you guide them? Uh, definitely look out for the City of Memphis website. Uh, it's www.memphistn.gov forward slash BDC and you can find out about all the uh, work that our department is doing I also encourage if you're interested in the 800 initiative whether being a part of it and or supporting it we are looking for corporations to contribute as well Uh, the 800 
www.ncpsa.org is that website, or you can always call our office at 901-636-6210, or Google us. Yeah, I must say, yeah, and you make it easy. I mean, you're on social media. You're, you're extremely accessible. So, Joanne, you are indeed a change maker. We greatly appreciate you coming on the show, and we love everything that uh, you're doing, and we love you as well. So thank you very much thank for all you. your efforts. Love you too. Power of good. Thank you for listening to the Changemakers Podcast, produced by City Current and powered by Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. To learn more about our guests and to share your stories of others leading by example, visit us online at citycurrent.com. Connect with us online using at City Current or follow the conversation using the hashtag Changemakers. Now, think big, start small, and act now. Be a changemaker. 